Would you stand, please? Turn to number 293. There's a fountain open in the house of God. I believe it. I've been here. <laughs> 293. There's a fountain open in the house of God Where the finest of sinners may go And no past the power of the crimson flood Of the blood that makes fire and snow Praise the Lord That fount was opened in the Savior's side. How the thief did rejoice in that name. And with dying, Lord, remember me, he cried. Oh, the blood was his sins all away. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, I am Lord. In the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the dream. I am washed in the blood of the grave. Will you come and please and save the Lord with me? Though your sins red like crimson do blow. And if dyed with scarlet stains your heart may be, I will make it white as the snow. Praise the Lord. Of the Lamb. Listen, I have overcome now by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm clothed in my raiment so white, and I'm on my journey to that glorious land where forever I'll dwell in the light. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, I am washed in the all-quenching blood of the This last verse, make it the grand finale. I can remember Brother Wilson many times saying, well, we don't have any palms to wave. Yes, we do. One in each hand. One there, one there. Wave them. Listen to that last verse. What are these in spotless robes and whence came they? They're singing with palms in their hands. These through tribulation gain the victory, having what? In the blood of the Lamb. Sing it, would you please? What are these in spotless robes and winds As they're singing with palms in their hands. Let's see your palms. These through tribulation gain the victory. Yes. Having washed in the blood. Overcome now by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm clothed in my raiment so white. What a hope! Where forever I'll dwell in the light. Oh, praise the Lord, I am Lord, and the all-witting blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the dew. Better to be blood washed than whitewashed, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. You know, Jesus, he spoke to those old Pharisees in his day, and 
He called them whited sepulchers. But thank God for that blood-bought institution. Thank God. It's good to see each one of you tonight. Good to be in camp meeting again. Amen. We have a wonderful heritage, don't we? Amen. I think I started going to camp meetings in about the mid-60s, and I don't think I've missed a year yet, thank the Lord. Been somewhere, sometime. And, you know, it just seems like whenever you go to camp meeting, the Lord likes to go to camp meeting. That's what I like about it. Amen. Well, we're thankful tonight. We're glad for each one that's come in. Some of you just got here. Amen. And we pray that the Lord will refresh in you and revive your hearts and spirits. Good to have Brother Owens here tonight. God bless you, Brother Owen. God bless you, my dear brother. Amen. All right, we want to remember uh, different needs, I'm sure, Brother Holly. You know, tonight they're letting George do it. <laughs> George is chairman and, and George is preaching. <laughs> that George over there is preaching. Amen. Well, thank the Lord tonight for all that God has done for us. And he has been so kind and gracious and loving. It's just so good to be a child of God tonight, to know, thank God, that, amen, we have a hope within our soul. It's brighter than the perfect day. Thank God. You know, with Christ, it's an endless hope. Amen. But without him, it's a hopeless end. We're thankful tonight. We want to look to the Lord now in prayer. We're certainly thankful for the prayers that God has already answered during this meeting, the testimonies that uh, praise and thanksgiving of how God has worked. And uh, certainly we need divine intervention, don't we? I mean, we could come and go through all the mechanics of church, you know. A lot of folks are doing the church thing today. But rather, we need God in our presence tonight. We need him in our services and uh, I, didn't, I didn't have any special requests turned in, but if you really feel you have an urgent one and you'd like to make it known tonight, anyone on this side, and if it, you feel it's really urgent, all right, this dear sister, all right, amen. Any on this side you'd like to make known audibly? All right, Brother Jerry, amen. All right, my dear brother. Those by the upraised hand, I know God knows each of the concerns that all of us have. I'm, I'm glad God knows. I'm glad God understands. Brother Walt sings a song, God knows all about it. I'm glad he does. Amen. As we look to the Lord, as I said, we want to remember Brother George Holly tonight as he stands before us. We're thankful for God's word that's went forth thus far in the meeting and and I'm sure God is going to honor us again, going to speak to us through our brother. And let's all have attentive ears, all right? You got your ears on tonight? Amen. And may the seed be sown on good ground tonight. Amen. So I said we're glad to have each one. And I'm going to ask Brother Jerry Baker, if he would, to come up. Brother Jerry's down in North Carolina now, Jacksonville, North Carolina. We're going to ask him to lead us in prayer. Let us go to the Lord this evening. Heavenly Father, we stand this evening in awe of the power of your presence. Oh God, we know tonight that, Father, you love your children and you are here tonight. And Lord, we just pray that every soul that is gathered here in this camp meeting tonight might be carried away in the presence of a glorious Almighty God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of the many blessings that you have poured out upon your people. Lord God, we just want to tell you tonight how much we love you and how much we depend on you tonight. Oh, God, we just thank you so much for all that you have done. Lord, tonight we pray, Father, and request that you would anoint the messenger this evening. That, oh God, that you would just anoint him with an anointing that, Father, that even he can't even begin to understand. 
Lord, and speak to our needs tonight, O oh God, and, and bring us alive and allow the, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us this evening, Father. Lord, we know that the harvest is white. There's much work to be done. And Lord, unless, Lord, you anoint us with the power of the Holy Spirit, the work cannot be finished. So, Lord, we thank you tonight that you have called us together. We thank you tonight for all the barriers and all the walls that you have tore down and washed away by the blood of Jesus and bring your family together in one. Oh, God, we thank you tonight. Lord, as each hand was raised this evening, Lord, we know that there are many unspoken requests and many serious needs physically and financially and spiritually. And Lord, we know that you are the God of all gods. And Lord, we know that you are able, Father, to reach down and supply every need that we might stand in need of tonight. Lord, we just pray now that you will bless this service. Have your way. Have your way in my heart. Yes. Oh God, that I might know in my heart that you are God of all. We ask these things in the blessed, blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
was saved by the Lamb. I know when I knelt, I felt the touch of His nail-scarred hand. Now I know where I stand. I know where I stand. The path that I followed was the way the world said to go. The world said to go. And the Lord called to me to follow Him much different yes, road. A much different road. I turned from my sin. He changed me within, and my heart was filled. When I found the place on the pathway to grace called Calvary's Hill. Yes, I know. Of his nail scarred hand. Now I know where I stand. I know where I stand. If you've gone your own way, you're lost and alone, and you've reached a dead end. Well, he's calling to you. You've heard his voice, won't you listen to him? When I found the cross, the world to me lost, it's tempting alone. I'm doing without all the worry and doubt, now that I know for sure. Yes, I know where His nail scarred hand. Now I know where I stand. 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 I'm no longer lost or at the cross. I was saved by the stand there's a time to hold on and we've all been through both of those situations we like this song Mandy come out of hiding tonight to sing this song bless her heart and I, you know I, I, I shouldn't say this but here's a woman nine months pregnant singing hold on <laughs> Hold on. Wonderful song, though. We need this sometime 
in the future. We will need it. Listen. Number 276. Number 276 if you need a book. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed from the darkness of the night that so thickly enveloped my soul. In my heart there have been rays of wonderful light. And the victory I have over death. Oh, that wonderful flood, how I felt as proud to say, when I plunged in its fathomless death. I redeem, I redeem. Praise the Lord, oh, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am saved from all sin, and I'm walking in the light. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 
am I redeemed from all sin And I'm walking in the light And thy spirit illumines my way I have no fear now within For the terror of the night Nor the arrow that fly in my day I'm redeemed Praise the Lord I am saved from all sin, and I'm walking in the light. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The redeemed, they shall walk with the pathway of the just, which shines brighter and brighter each day. They shall sing and shall talk with the bright and jelly foes, where all sorrow and sighs be away. Praise the Lord, oh, I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am saved from all sin, and I'm walking in the light. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Brother Garrison, Brother Chapman, and the son have a song tonight. pray for us. I think we'll probably need it. <laughs> get up here for everybody. You can't even get your finger working. Look there. Anyway, I'm going to try one here. I think it fits a lot of people. I ain't going to say it fits people here tonight, but it's a lot of outside world people fits. And like I'm saying, I hope I don't forget the words there. I ain't did it a couple of times. Oh, house of gold. Some people steal, they cheat and lie. What wealth and what that it will buy. But don't you know on the judgment day that gold and silver will melt away I'd rather be in a deep dark grave than to know my soul I say and to live in this world in a house of gold and deny my Lord And lose my soul What good is gold And silver too When your heart not Good and pure Oh sinner Hear me when I say Battle fall on your knees and pray. I'd rather be in a deep dark grave than to know my soul I say and live in this world 
and a house of gold and deny my Lord and to lose my soul and deny my Lord and lose my soul Tess, this song here, I want you to know this is my son, this is my father-in-law, so there's three generations up here. My son wrote this song, and he composed the music and the words, and uh, he's going to do it for you right now. I think it's a real good song. Take it away, Stuart. All right, here we go. Well, come on, let's go. Down to the river Where the old preacher preached Sunday school And hear the church bells Ringing soft and low Singing all sinners shall be free Well, well I can hear my Savior calling on me It's the best thing to see where the land is full of flowers, look around, it's all ours. And Jesus welcome you to come on in. Now in this life on earth shall end We'll stand before the face of God And then I heard him say My son come this way And now praise the Lord I made it home Well I can hear my Savior calling on me It's the best thing to see where the land is full of flowers look around it's all ours and Jesus welcome you to come on in yeah Jesus welcome you to come on in come on in Okay, they're, they're actually going to let me do one. Uh, I didn't get up here last year. Uh, this song here, I like it a lot. Uh, a lot of times we forget about the Lord, but he never forgets about us. So this song kind of reflects on that a little bit. Can you kick it off for me, David? It goes like this. Well, I don't read the word as often as I should. And I don't pray to God as often as I could. But I know enough to know his love is guaranteed. Sometimes I overlook him. But he still looks over me Sometimes I overlook the fact That he gave his only son But he stood in to bear my sins Each and every one He sends angels to protect my home And family Sometimes I overlook him, but he still looks over me. I fell behind on promises I made. 
But he's forgiven all my delay The time I spend in prayer Is not what it should be Sometimes I overlook him But he still looks over me Sometimes I overlook the fact that he gave his only son But he stood in to bear my sins Each and every one He sends angels to protect my home and family Sometimes I overlook him But he still looks over me Sometimes I overlook him, but he still looks over me. Thank you. We like to thank everyone of y'all, and we hope God will be good to everyone of y'all. We love to come up here. I'm, we ain't met nobody yet that ain't been good and friendly and, and lovely and I hope God bless everyone y'all and when you do go back home hope everyone you have a safe trip I have a quartet from North Hodge Louisiana that's as far as you can go in Louisiana <laughs> He's just jealous because he don't live down there. That's all it is. It's good to be back in Newark again and see all the faces that just make us feel welcome. And I'm just, I just love coming, and I thank the Lord that he's placed it in our heart to come and be a part of the camp meeting here. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul. Cause I knew the Lord had control. Well, I knew I was walking in the light. Cause I've been on my knees in the night. And I prayed to the Lord gave a sign. And now I'm feeling mighty fine. Well, I'm feeling mighty fine. Mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. I've got heaven, heaven on my mind. Heaven on my mind. Oh, my heaven mind. On my mind. Don't you know, you know I want you to go? Yes, I want you to go. Where the milk and honey flow. And honey flow. Milk and honey flow. There's the light that always shines. Always shines. Light that always shines. Deep inside. In this heart of mine. This heart of mine. This heart of mine. I've got heaven, heaven on my mind, and now I'm feeling mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. I've been walking with Jesus all the time. We're walking and talking as we climb. We're traveling a road to the sky. When I die, he's been telling me all about that land, and he tells me that everything is grand, and he says that a home will be mine, and now I'm feeling mighty fine. Well, I'm feeling mighty fine. Mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. I've got heaven on my mind. On my mind. Heaven on my mind. Don't Bye.
that it fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. Well, I'm feeling mighty fine. I've got heaven on my mind. Don't you know I want to go where the milk and honey flow. There's a light always shines. This heart of mine, I've got heaven, heaven on my mind, and now I'm feeling mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. You know, many times we go through life and we got the world by the tail sometimes and then we find out we don't really have it I know several years ago that I thought that I was really right man I really thought I was right but you know what God helped me to realize it's not about me it's about God and when we know it all, it's all about God then we can have everything we need I'm so thankful tonight that he's all I need he's everything that I need tonight And trouble. I was seeking for fortune and fame. I had nothing but doubts and confusion. But now I have it. I have everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus to show me the way. He saved me and He gave me life eternal. And now I have everything. I have everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus to show me the way. The Dugan's got a, a special tonight. Okay. Yeah. What's next from that man?
That's exactly the way I'd do it if I could do it. <laughs> wow. Brother Phil McKnight has a song. this race years ago and my determination from that point to this time here has been the same I've got to make heaven my home I've got to get there and I want my life to make a difference don't want to be one of those individuals that's walking through life you know do your little 30 years get your little watch you know what I mean and get your little party get your clock and you go on about your business don't want to live that way my desire is to be what God would have me to be. And I'm serious about my salvation tonight. I ask you to pray for us that attempt to sing this song, the glory of God. It's my desire to live for My desire to live for Him. I too was once was lost, but I found my way to God. desire to live for Him. It's my desire to help a soul my desire to be like he you see I remember years ago you know I was undesirable I was unsaved doing my own thing grandma's praying for me everybody in church praying for me hey amen I was a mess I don't know if you guys remember or not but I like to remember those type of things because when the devil comes around and begins to kind of nip at your heels a little bit, God allows us to remember how filthy we were, how unlovely we were. 
Amen. And then you begin to think, you know something, I think I can go on another month. I, I think I can go on two more months. And next thing you know, it's a year. And next thing you know, it's two years. And amen, it's this time that the master comes around and just lets you know he still loves you. Amen. If you could see where Jesus brought me from and what I am today, then you would know the reasons why I speaking to your heart tonight? Do you have a desire to live for the Lord? Won't you do like this young man did to come up here and pray and get it settled tonight? Amen. Maybe you're a wayward one. Maybe you're a prodigal. Won't you return to him tonight? Won't you come to Jesus tonight? Amen. Won't you come to Christ tonight, right now? Brother Chad, where are you at?
this first verse it is through Judas' eyes at the Last Supper. Pray. The moment our eyes met, I knew this was the night that I would betray him. The precious Lamb of God disciple was aware of my plan till he rose from the table something in his hand his holy eyes pierced through me revealing all my I knew his wrath was coming, and this would be the end. But he bowed, and he washed my feet, knowing But he's no worse than I The moment I gave in To Satan's compromise Unthankful that Jesus Had saved me from hell I was walking so proudly that's when I fell his holy eyes pierced through me revealing all my sin I knew his wrath was coming and this would be the end But he bowed and he washed my feet, knowing that I was the cause of his grief when he should have scolded.
mercy, forgiveness. You know, I discovered that failure doesn't have to be final. <laughs> Aren't we all glad of that tonight? Thank God. Remember that. Failure doesn't have to be final. All right. Well, thankful for God's spirit. Amen. And coming in and visiting our hearts. Now it's time for the word. And God has chose the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. So we're going to ask Brother George Holly at this time to come to unburden his heart. If you'd like to stand while he comes. You've been sitting quite a while. Amen. God bless you. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 6, we'll begin at verse number 9. Apostle Paul dealing with a very sensitive subject, but he doesn't beat any bones about it. He just gets right to the point. He looks at those believers, those baby believers, and he said this, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before your presence tonight, we thank you for this blessed privilege that you've given to us to be gathered together in heavenly places like this. Thank you for victory around the altar and for the presence of your Holy Spirit that deals with our hearts and shows us our needs tonight. Thank you for each one that's made their way here. Many have traveled many, many miles to be here and you've, you've honored that and blessed every effort and we thank you for that. We believe that we've gathered here tonight to serve the Lord and to worship the Lord. We've come into your house. May we continue to focus our attention upon you. But Lord, you are the one that will be speaking. We pray that your spirit would use us for your glory tonight. We pray that you would speak through these lips of clay. We realize that we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, but we ask, Lord, that in the hands of the master that you would use us tonight. Pour us out, and may they only see you tonight. Help me to be faithful to you. Help me to be faithful to your word. Help me to be faithful to the souls of those that are here in this service. And for everything that's accomplished, may we not fail to praise you for it. For it's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The Apostle Paul speaking to these new converts that are relatively new in their walk with the Lord and dealing with an uncomfortable and uneasy situation as we find that these Corinthian believers had been a part and under the influence of the Greek culture and the Grecian influence. And he's trying to set them straight on some things because being new converts and saved out of paganism and saved out of heathenism and, and polytheism to where with the Grecian culture they believed in many gods. And it reminded me of what the Apostle Paul found there in the book of Acts when he made a, that trip up Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And, and he saw the influence that the Greeks had had and their polytheism as he was walking around through there and looking at their various monuments and he said to them in verse number 22, he said, you're just too superstitious. For as I was walking up Mars Hill, I saw this inscription on what it says, to the unknown God. 
And so that culture had carried over into the lives and hearts of these Corinthian believers and even to the point that some of them were trying to incorporate the temple prostitutes. And we find that in chapter 5, verse number 1, there was an issue that hadn't been dealt with in the church to the point that it had never been named even among the Gentiles before to where a man had been with his father's wife and that he wasn't with his mother. It was, apparently was like a stepmother, but a man had been in his, with his father's wife and, and they had failed to do anything about that. And he reminded them in verse number 6 of how a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Sometimes we wonder why we have so many uprisings in our churches and that's because we allow way too much leaven to go on without dealing with it. And in some of our churches, we've allowed this to snowball and the ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets to the point that where it's too big to stop. And I say, and the apostle Paul was dealing with, somewhere we're gonna have to stop this ball rolling and not allow some of these things to go on and take a stand on God's word. Amen. And so they were taking, they were taking advantage of and kind of, uh, 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 kind of taking advantage of this whole thing about this new grace. In verse number 12, he deals with something. He says to them, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are, all, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. As we look at this, if we're not careful, we can misunderstand. I've heard this misused and abused to an extent because there are some that think that this is a contrast between living under the law and living under this day of grace. Living under the law of Moses versus living under grace. But I say to you, that's not what this verse is all about. And we see the abuse of grace if we look at it that way. As a matter of fact, I've seen that carried over in some of our churches. I've heard testimonies to this extent, and there's nothing wrong within and of itself in this testimony, but I've heard people testify something like this. Well, bless God, since I'm saved now, I can do anything I want to, but the Lord changed my want to. And that's wonderful, I'm glad for that. But the thing that concerns me tonight is I'm afraid that there aren't many want to's changing. Amen. But there are those that are still hanging on to grace and they're abusing grace to the point where, well thank God now that I'm saved by grace, I, I can do whatever I want to because I'm saved by grace. And so bless our little old heart, we just can't help it but sin more or less in word, thought, and deed every day. The apostle Paul dealt with that in Romans chapter six and, and in verses one and two, he said, what shall I more say? Shall we continue in sin? And he said, God forbid. God forbid that we would continue in sin. I'm glad that there's grace not only to forgive us for our sin, but thank God there's grace to overcome it. And then we got too many that are trying to overlook it. I tried to overlook it before I got saved, but I needed power in the blood of Jesus to overcome sin. And there's been an abuse of that in our churches. Listen to me, though many of us here may be wesley and our men in, in theology, there are many folks that occupy the pews of our churches that are Calvinistic in their living. God help us. God help us. And so this is not a contrast or a comparison between the law of Moses versus the law of grace. This is a comparison between the Grecian law versus this new life in the grace of God. And so what he was saying to them, what verse number 12 is saying, even though he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What he was saying to them was this, because I think they were using this excuse well, Brother Paul, he was kind of like a district superintendent or something. He's just paying the church a visit and he kind of called them on the carpet about this and they begin to give excuse. But Brother Paul, but the Grecian culture, this is permissible in our culture. They say this is not against the law to do this. As a matter of fact, this thing that we're involved with is even politically correct in our day. The Apostle Paul's looking at them and wanting them to know. He said, I admit, I acknowledge that what the Grecian law says is okay for you. It would be okay for me if I wanted to do it. 
I want you to know that what would be politically correct for society today, it may very well be politically correct for me. I want you to know that what the law would, the law would allow for you, it also allows for me. I could do some of those same things according to the Grecian law and culture. But he looked at those young believers and said to them, but I won't. Even though those things are lawful for me, listen church, and what Paul was saying to them is somewhere we are going to have to learn to where to draw the line. I'm afraid that if we allow the culture of our day and if we allow society to draw our lines for us, uh, listen to me, I'm not sure that there are any lines in our society anymore, that the morals and values have gone out the door and that what used to be good is now wrong and what used to be wrong is now okay. And there are no values or absolutes. And our society has lowered the standard so much that we can come into our churches and sing the songs and worship the Lord and go back out and live the same way we did and pride ourselves in knowing that we're just a little bit better than the rest of the world. But God's people has a standard that is higher than that. And yet we're allowing society to set our standard. And God help us that I believe that the watchword and song of the church today still ought to be holiness and God's people have a standard that is above that of the world and I thought about those school days and there would be the schoolyard bullies on the playground and you remember how they'd come up to some of the little fellows like maybe I was then and they would draw a line and say I dare you to cross it I dare you to cross it and depending on how big the bully was I'd decide whether I would cross it or not but listen to me the devil and the world is drawing lines and daring us to cross it and too many in our churches are crossing the line on that dare and it's time that we took a stand and start drawing some lines in the sand and tell the devil and the world not only, listen, if you want to get to me you're going to have to cross the line because I've drawn the lines and I will not cross them it may be socially acceptable it may be politically correct it may be all right in the eyes of the world but me and the Lord are going to draw some lines amen God help us God help us let me ask you something tonight where have you drawn your lines where have you drawn your lines I'm not here tonight many of you don't know me I'm not here tonight to tell you where you're to draw your lines I know where I draw my lines the Apostle Paul makes it clear where he draws his lines. What I am going to do is I'm going to give you, I thought about Brother Wilson this morning that talked about the ground rules. But I want to share with you some guidelines that the Apostle Paul uses in his life to let them know where he draws the line. And that's some guidelines that I want to use where I draw the lines. I did not come here tonight to tell you young ladies how long your dress ought to be or how short it ought to be. I didn't come here to tell you how long your sleeve ought to be or how short it ought to be. I didn't come here to tell you how long your pants legs ought to be or shouldn't be. I didn't come here to tell you how much jewelry to wear or how much not to wear. I didn't come here to tell you how long your hair ought to be or how short it ought to be. I didn't come here to tell you how much makeup to put on or makeup to take off. Now don't get too quiet on me. Amen. Now I've seen, I've seen some ladies, not the ones you're thinking of, but other ones that I thought it would sure be a blessing to everybody else, they'd put a little bit on. <laughs> and then I've seen some others that they must have got their makeup tips when they were taking cake decorating classes because they bought it by the gallon bucket, put it in a little thing and squirted it on and then used a spatula to spread it on, you know. <laughs> Listen to me. But I want us to look at the Apostle Paul tonight now listen, I didn't say that to t make light necessarily of those things because we got to get to a place God's people have a standard. God's people draw some lines. But I will say this to you. 
It must be the Holy Ghost of God as we get in the Word of God and in our private time as we pray and as we listen to the Word of God to allow the Holy Spirit to come and deal with our hearts. And then as the Holy Spirit convicts us, we can have some lines drawn that though the church may change and though the leadership may change and though the world may change, we know what we settled with God and we know where he wants us to stand. And whether whether it's 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years from now, we still have our lines drawn. Amen. 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 It's kind of amazing to me that there were some in our churches used to draw some lines. They had line, different lines 10 years ago, but we've kind of erased them and made some new lines. I'll tell you why, because we didn't get them from the Holy Spirit or we didn't get them from the Word of God. We got them from man. Now don't get too quiet on me. I think you're guilty. Let me go on. He said, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I want to share with you as quickly as I can some of the guidelines that the Apostle Paul used for his own life that I think would be beneficial for us to use. And I'm going to ask you that long after this service is over, whether you're a senior citizen tonight or whether you're one of the young people, I want you to know these guidelines will help you. These guidelines will help you, and we need to know where to draw the line. Amen. Amen. First of all, he says to them, he gives us a list in verses 9 and 10. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He wanted to let them know that regardless of what they professed, regardless of what they didn't profess, regardless of how long they'd been saved or whether they'd been saved or not, regardless of which church they belonged to, regardless of which man they were saved under, he wanted to let them know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Some of us need to get that through here, that we must realize unrighteousness will not enter heaven regardless of how long you've been in the church then he goes on to list some things and he talked about he talked about fornication because that was the issue in chapter 5 and dealing a lot of times fornication dealt with sexual sin most of the time it dealt with premarital sexual sin then he talked about idolatry and he talked about adultery and then he talked about effeminate. And yes, that word effeminate in the King James Version does mean homosexuality. And, he, and we find, he said, are those abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. None of these shall inherit the kingdom of God. It matters not how long you've been saved. It matters not which church you belong to. It matters not whether you've been baptized or not. It matters not how much you put in the offering plate. If these things are present in your life, he said you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what was he doing? He's saying here's principle number one. Here's where I draw my lines. I will draw my line on anything that is exposed by God's word. If God's word says it's wrong, then it'll still be wrong for me. If God's word says I ought to do it, then I'll do it. If God's word says I shall not do it, then I shall not do it. Amen, Brother George. I think that's pretty good advice. Brother Wilson alluded briefly this morning about Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. I think that's a good place for us to start. I thought long before prayer got out of school, they wouldn't have got it out of school if it hadn't been out of home. And long before they started having an uprising about the Ten Commandments being in the courthouse and public places, if we started abiding by and living it in the home, it would have been much more difficult to get it out of the courthouse. And so going back to the Ten Commandments, yes, they are the Ten Commandments and not the ten suggestions and we look at it and we kind of grade ourselves and say well ten out of eight out of ten is not too bad and yet James said in chapter 2 verse number 10 he that keepeth the whole law and yet offend in one point he's guilty of all and so he said, I will draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word. And so we look at the Ten Commandments, and you know them. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Oh, why we brought that up. Boy, since you brought that up, let's discuss it in a minute. You realize that we've got folks in our churches that think that somehow that's kind of limited just the fact of not taking God or Jesus' name in vain. And we've got some folks that think that as long as they don't use God's name and Jesus' name, they can use whatever other words they want to. 
God's standard, God's people's standard is better than that. We gotta draw our lines farther than that. I thought about what Paul told the Colossian people. In Galatians chapter three, verse number eight, he says, but now ye also put off all these, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. It's not just a matter of taking God's name in vain, but God's people draw a line and say, I don't want my mouth to be a potty mouth, and we gotta be careful, young people, about the slang that we use as well. We'll be careful about the filthy communication. I'm gonna share something with you you won't believe, but it happened. I was sitting across the table at a meal in a restaurant with a, with a, young, a young minister. We were dealing with an unpleasant issue that we were just talking about. That young minister was getting upset with me because of my position on the certain issue. And before I knew it, there were four letter, there's a four letter word came out of his mouth. I was just shocked. I was shocked. What shocked me even more was when I brought it up to his superior that the superior didn't think it was any big deal either because it hadn't been taking God's name in vain. I thought, listen to me. We wonder why we have such carnal uprisings when somebody can have a carnal fit and their tongue, listen, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. And so we got to be careful. We got to draw the line. God, the, the people of the world may be using off color four letter words and may be talking filthy, but God's people need to draw a line and say, I will not allow filthy communication to come out of my mouth. Whether it's taking God's name or vain or whether it's the cussing of our day, God help us to have a higher standard than that. Amen. 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 He went on, we find out, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I thought, Lord, help us. We've all just about forgotten that that's even one of the Ten Commandments. Some of the folks in our churches, they want to come to the eight o'clock service so that they can pay their, get ease their conscience and pay their little bit and then have the rest of the day for themselves. And we've forgotten that the Lord's day is about resting our body and worshiping the Lord. And we run here, there, and yonder, go to the flea market, run to the mall and do this and that. Then we're too worn out to come back to church on Sunday night and some of our churches don't even have church on Sunday night so we can just run out and do everything else. God help us. What are you talking about? He says I'll draw a line. God's word. I will draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word. And we know the last, we know honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. That's just a good place to start. But he even uses these here in verses nine and 10. If God's word says it's wrong, we'll draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word. Amen, amen, amen. Lord help us. Let me give you another example of how that works. For you see, in our society today, there's a lot of things that would be politically correct. There's a lot of things that we could do that would be socially acceptable and would not be against the law. I haven't seen my lovely wife for about 12, 12 or 13 days now. I'm eager to get home. But if I greet my wife at the door and she greets me with a big old smile, I'm not sure if it, with, she had this news, it'd be a big smile. But supposing my wife greeted me at the door with a big old smile and said, honey, guess what? I got some good news for you. We're expecting our third child. <laughs> now that may not sound like any big deal, but our children are ages 28 and 26. <laughs> Once she revived me and got me up out of the floor, I could say, I could say, Honey, you know, this is just really not a good time in our life. This is not gonna fit in with our schedule. This is really, this is really not, I mean, just consider yourself, you're not as young as you were when we had the other two boys, and I thought, you know, I'm concerned about your health. It would be politically correct. It would be socially acceptable. It would not be against the law if we decided, well, maybe we'll just abort this little one because it would just really crimp our style right now. What do you do? I draw a line because it's exposed by God's word. 
God's word says thou shalt not kill, whether, it, whether it's a senior citizen that's on their deathbed or whether it's someone else innocently or whether it's an unborn baby in mother's fetus, so thou shalt not kill. We draw the line. Amen, Brother George. The Apostle Paul talked about these sexual sins. And listen, church, we got to draw the line on those. Whether it, I thought about what Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number four. Young people, listen to this. And the reason I'm only pointing this toward you is because I didn't realize that there are some of our young people that don't have a clue about what I'm about to say. But in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number four, it says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And one of the things we're gonna to have to draw our lines when it comes to sexual practices is that the only way that God approves it and for the child of God is within the framework of marriage between a man and a woman. Not premarital sex, not extramarital sex, not same sex, but within one, between one man and one woman within the framework of marriage. And in spite of what former presidents may say, it is sexual relationships, whether it is intercourse or oral. And, and I, I, what, then listen to me, older folks, I know that that kind of takes you aback. And we, maybe we shouldn't say things like that in a church, but listen to me. Those are issues that our young people are dealing with. And we, if we're fooling ourselves, if we don't think they're battling with it and struggling with it, I was talking with a friend of mine who was a youth counselor in a youth camp not too long ago. Not the youth camp you're thinking of, but another one. And I was talking with them and they were teaching the young people. And there was a beautiful 13 year old girl came up to him after their lesson and said to him and his wife, I did not know that it was wrong to have premarital sex. I was making a hospital visit not too long ago there was a young lady there in her 30s that grew up in our church. She has three children. Her oldest daughter is in the sixth grade. While I was visiting there at the hospital, I was talking with her, and she shared with me that one of the classmates of her daughter, a sixth grader, was expecting a child. What are you talking about? Young people, if we don't draw our lines ahead of time, it may be. The world is going to tell you that it is okay as long as it's safe. But God's word says it's not okay unless it's within the framework of marriage. Amen, Brother George. And so he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And so he said, I'll draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word. If God's word says it's wrong, that's where I draw my line. We could park here a lot longer, but we need to go on. We learn something else from the Apostle Paul here about where he draws his lines. I'm not telling you where to draw your lines, but I'm giving you some guidelines. Draw a line on anything that's exposed by God's word. But I want you to notice what he said. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Guideline number two. Not only will I draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word, but I will draw a line on anything that is not expedient. What does that mean, Brother George? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You're asking good questions. Keep it up. Since you brought it up, let's discuss it a minute. We find that word expedient in, again in, in John chapter 16, verse number 7. In John chapter 16, verse number 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That word expedient has several, there are several words that give us the same meaning of the word expedient. It means, it, it, he said, when Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away, it is to your advantage. It will be to your benefit. It will be conducive. For you, it will contribute to you spiritually and otherwise. It is necessary for you that I go away. 
that is another area where we need to learn to draw our lines. Do you realize we have some folks in our churches, okay, Brother George, I'll draw a line on anything that is exposed by God's word. But you realize we got some of the folks in our churches that think if it's not read out in black and white or in red in the scripture, that because God's word doesn't expose it, then we must have a right to be able to do it. And there's a lot of gray area that is not spelled out in the word of God. And we got people that are looking at like that, like they're looking for a tax loophole with the IRS. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to see how close to sin we can get without falling into it rather than seeing how far away we can stay from it. Listen, church, if you keep getting close to the end of it, you no wonder you keep falling into temptation. If you keep falling out of bed, it's a good indication you're staying too close to where you got in. Amen. Reminds me of the story. Reminds me of the story that I read about the queen that was looking for a carriage driver. And she sent out applications throughout her kingdom. And so the first applicant came in and she asked him a question. Will you, my travels take me along a narrow uh, mountain passageway. How close can you get to the edge without going over? The first applicant said, oh queen, I'm a good driver. I can get within three feet of the edge without going over. The queen said, thank you, called in the next applicant. The next applicant came in. She asked the same question. How close can you get to the edge without take, dropping my carriage over? She, he said to her, Queen, I'm a wonderful driver. I can come within a foot and a half without going over the edge. She said, thank you very much. The third applicant came in and she asked the same question. How close can you get to the edge without going over? The applicant looked at her and said, Oh, Queen, you're special. You're precious to our kingdom. I wouldn't see how close I would get the edge. I'd see how far from the edge I could take it. She said, you're hired. Amen. Listen to me, young people. It's not about how close can I get to sin and still be a Christian, but God help me to draw some lines that will keep me away from it. And so there, there are some areas that may not be exposed by God's word so clearly, but also let me use a guideline that I will draw a line on anything that is not expedient. That means if it is not to my advantage, if it is not beneficial emotionally, physically, uh, fi uh, maybe financially or especially spiritually if it's not going to benefit me if it's not necessary maybe I need to draw a line there hello let me, let me put it this way supposing supposing the apostle Paul and I were driving down the road if he came to my house to visit we would get in the mall, maybe get in the car, maybe I would, my wife and I would want to take him to the mall. The mall's about 24 miles from our house. We have to go down to Huntington, West Virginia, cross over, go around Route 60 West, and we would finally make it to the mall. And so the Apostle Paul and I jump in the car. We're going to the mall, maybe to the Bible bookstore. That'd be a good place for us to go. But on our way around Route 60 West, as we are east, I forget, Route 60 East, on our way around Route 60 East, as we're driving down there on our way to the mall to the Bible bookstore, I could say, hey, Paul, look over there. We could look to our left, and there would be kind of a run-down-looking white painted shack that on the front of it has three X's on it. We're going to the bookstore. We could say, there's some books in there, Paul. Listen to me. Uh-uh, we don't go in there. We draw a line. That's not expedient. That's not beneficial. That would not be to our advantage. That's not, that's not conducive to godly living. It would not be against the law. It would, may even be politically correct. It may even be socially acceptable with some people. But God's people draw a line. Amen. We could go on down the road, not turn in there. We could go on down the road, and I could say, look there, Paul. I think you're a pretty good gentleman, Paul. Look, there's a place that says gentleman's club. No gentleman would go in a hell hole like that. It would be socially acceptable. It would not be against the law. It would be politically correct if we could pull in there and go to the gentleman's club, but we draw a line. That is not expedient. It's not necessary, it's not beneficial, it's not conducive to godly living. 
Oh, we could go on down the road. Oh, Paul, here's the latest craze here in our society today. Look there, there's, there's a tattoo and piercing parlor. Why don't, what do you say, Paul? We'll go in, we'll get a big picture of Jesus on our chest and then just pull our shirt open when we're preaching. Some of you just about turn your stomach, the mental picture of that, huh? Listen to me. Listen to me. Now, I didn't look around the congregation, so I'm not picking on anybody. Young people, be careful. Adults, be careful about jumping on every fad and fashion bandwagon that comes along. Some of our young people are doing some things to their bodies that one of these days they're going to look in the mirror and they're going to say, what in the world was I thinking? And they're going to realize, oh, that's right, I wasn't thinking. Because some of you adults have done the same thing and you've lived long enough to regret it. And you say, but Brother George, the Bible doesn't, well, I thought, listen to me. Let me, the book of Leviticus chapter 19, verse number 28 in Leviticus 19, 28, the Lord was telling Moses as they'd been brought out of Egyptian bondage and was going in, one of them to go in the promised land, one of the things he told them, he told them and warned them about cutting themselves and marking their bodies. Now you say, Brother George, that, that, I'm not sure that talks about piercing and such like, but listen to me, it had to do with taking on the practices of their heathen neighbors and those pagan practices. And even if the cutting part doesn't talk about piercing, we've got some of our young people and some of you adults may not be aware of it. But if we were able to pull up some pants legs or roll up some sleeves, one of the things that's happening among our young people is cutting. I thought about in 1 Kings chapter 18 on Mount Carmel that when the prophets of Baal were not able to call fire down from heaven, they got desperate and in their pagan practices, they started cutting themselves till blood gushed out. I never heard of that. I never dealt with that till I, when I was pastoring a few years ago, there was a woman in my church that was doing that. She was mutilating herself and, 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 and she would take a hammer and beat her hand and take a screwdriver and gouge her arms and her legs and I thought, God help us. You say, well, what, what's, all, what, what's the deal with piercing? I, there's, listen, some of the, we've got some young people and adults that are piercing parts of their bodies I can't even mention in mixed company like this. And why in the world they would want to do that, I don't know. I went to a restaurant not long ago, not the one you're thinking of, but another one. But I went to a restaurant not long ago, and there was a young lady, a beautiful young lady like you all, greeted me at the door. And she started talking to me. She was to take me to my seat. And I couldn't hardly understand the word she was saying. And I thought, I know I'm a little hard of hearing, but I, I ought to be able to understand her. And then she opened her mouth wide enough that I found out what the problem was. She had a metal rod stuck through her tongue. And I, and I couldn't hear her for that flapping around through there. She couldn't talk plain because of that rod stuck through her tongue. If I'd have been her boss and manager, I'd said, listen, you need to get that thing out of there. You need to talk to my people where they can understand you. Amen. Now don't get too quiet. I'll think you're guilty. <laughs> I'll, I'll, all funniness aside though, I was in a camp meeting last, last year. Not, not this one, but another one. I was in a camp meeting last year in eastern Pennsylvania. And I was there with a guy that uh, other evangelist had been a missionary to Kenya. And his wife, he'd met his wife. She had been a nurse in Tenwick Hospital in Kenya. And, and he shared this with us in that camp meeting because this was an area where some of the natives there had put bones through their nose and the big things in their ears and lips and that sort of thing. And they were into piercing. And God was giving them revival there. And unbeknownst to them, the Holy Spirit had been dealing with some of those new converts and they started coming to the hospital. And they were asking the attendants at the hospital to sew up their piercings. They hadn't preached about it, hadn't said anything about it. They knew that that was their culture, but the Holy Spirit had been dealing with them about it. And so they asked them out of curiosity, why do you want us to do that? And some of those converts said, because we want to get rid of any evidence of our pagan past. 
draw a line on an anything that is not expedient. The apostle Paul and I are going down the road. We're driving there and there's a lot of things that we could be doing, but there's some things that just as a child of God, it's not beneficial, it's not conducive to godly living, it, is not, it does not contribute to a holiness, a, a testimony, and we gotta draw a line on that. Just because everybody else is doing it, or because it's socially acceptable, or because it may be politically correct, is it expedient? Is it necessary really? God help us. Listen to me. God's word may not be so clear on how we dress. It does. It is very plain that God's people dress modestly. Amen. Amen. And that's about as clear as it gets. And we have some that can get legalistic and pharisaical and make it what they want it to be. But listen to me. I still believe God's people have a standard that's better than that of the world. And though it may not be outlined in a lot of detail, we need to get before God and say, oh God, where do you want me to draw my line? Because I believe that you want us to be modest. That means if I got to run, walk around and, and kind of hold it real close so nobody gets a peek, and, or I got to be careful about how I sit or how I bend over, that's a good indication. It may need a little more material on it. Amen. Amen. And if it is so tight that if it doesn't leave much up to the imagination, and if it becomes appealing and drawing an attraction to the opposite sex, whether it's a boy or a girl or a man or a woman, it's a good indication we may need to loosen up just a little bit. It's not conducive to godly living. It may be 90 degrees outside, but God's people don't have to strip off half naked like the rest of the world does either. It kind, it kind of boggles my mind that here in the United States under the ungodly influence of, of England and the such like that we think that the answer to cooling off is stripping off and yet you go to countries where it's hot and they think the answer to cooling off is covering up the skin. Now listen. I didn't tell you how long your sleeve needed to be. I didn't tell you, I'm not telling you how long your skirt and dress need to be or your pants, but I'm saying we need to get before God and say, God, help me, help me. You show me where I need to draw the line. Is it beneficial? Is it conducive to godly living? Is it to my advantage emotionally, spiritually, physically? Amen. 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 Let me go on before I kill the service. Oh, if that kills the service, we need to have the funeral, okay? The apostle Paul said, we need to draw a line. I'll draw a line on anything that's exposed by God's word. I'll draw a line on anything that is not expedient. Now, he tells us another area where we need to draw the line. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. There's the other area where we draw the line. I will draw a line on anything that enslaves me. Amen. Amen. Now, I realize the Bible doesn't say one word about cigarettes. The Bible doesn't say one word about rubbing snuff. The Bible doesn't say one word about chewing tobacco. We've got some in our churches would like to make a debate about social drinking. God help us. Amen. We draw a line. If it is addictive, if it enslaves, we just stay away from it. For the life of me, when I go back to creation and I look when God created the heavens and the earth and when he created the things on this earth, when he put man in the garden, he put man in the garden to have dominion over all of the rest of creation. Amen. And to think that we have, this ought to be a good evidence against evolution, to think that we have degraded to the extent that creation now has dominion over us to think that there are some people that are struggling with something about the size of that and it's got them so addictive and they've got them so in such a grip that they can't break free of it. Paul said, I will draw a line. God's word may not say a thing about that, but if it's gonna enslave me, I don't want any part of it. 
Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul and I going down the road. I, I buy a lot of gas lately. <laughs> I go I go in a lot of convenience stores to get the gas. I tell you what, that's a cesspool of temptation to go in a convenience store. Get my gas. If I want to go inside the convenience store, I open it up. A lot of times I can look over here and they're just row after row, Budweiser, whatever. I can look over here. I can see all carton after carton. I can see tin after tin. I can see pouch after pouch of different tobacco products. If I were old enough, I could go over there and buy all the booze I wanted. If I were old enough, I could go over here and buy all the tobacco products I wanted. I get up to the counter, could pay for that. But matter of fact, it's not against the law. It's socially acceptable. It would be politically correct. Within our culture, that's just a normal thing to do. It blows my mind that our culture has got to the place that they think you can't have a party unless you just get wiped out of your mind with booze and drugs and the such like. And so it's socially acceptable. We gotta drink to everything. I'll drink to that. And so I could, I could have my arm loaded with tobacco. I could have a cart. I could have a, a six pack of bud. I could get to the counter and I could, oh, oh yeah, this is Wednesday. Powerball night. Well, boy, couldn't I help my church if I hit the Powerball. It's socially acceptable. It's not against the law. Matter of fact, the government wants us to buy them. They're trying to convince us to bail out our schools, but it ain't worked yet. Paul, what do you say? What do you say we get one of them? Oh, by the way, we were on our way to the mall to the Bible bookstore. There's some reading material behind the counter there. May have a brown wrapper over it so you can't see the picture, but it's not against the law to buy it. Oh, no. What are we doing? Withdrawal. That's not expedient. That's not beneficial. That's not conducive to godly living. That's not to my advantage emotionally or spiritually. It may not be outlined in God's word in those terms, but we better draw some lines there. Amen. We're going down the road. How about let's turn it on some tunes, Paul? Listen, I go down the road, down, down where I, I love southern gospel music. That's one of the reasons I like coming here among many other reasons. But down our way, we have a 24-hour Southern Gospel station. I listen to that when I'm there and pick it up in the radio. When I come to Columbus to see my sons, I can't get Southern Gospel, but I turn it on 104.9, The River, contemporary Christian music. I like it. I like a lot of it. But when I'm on the road and I can't find that, I'm channel surfing. And it's not against the law for me to channel surf. I can turn it on anything I want to on my radio. But man, when I hit that scan button, it's amazing what you hear on that scan button. Man, I'll hear stuff like gangster rap and, and like sex, drugs, and all, rock and roll and all that. I've even heard stuff like prop me up against the jukebox when I'm gone and, and whiskey for my men and beer for my horses. And I thought, Lord help us. It's not against the law for me to listen to that. But sometimes we wonder why we struggle spiritually because we haven't learned where to draw our lines. That's not conducive to godly living. I don't want to hear another cry in your beer or tear in my beer song. Amen. Now there's a lot of good music out there and it may not be southern gospel or contemporary, but there's some of it. We need to draw a line because it's not going to help us spiritually. I go into the motel room and I can sit down in the motel room and they provide cable TV. Some of them even provide movies that you could buy. It's not against the law. It would be socially acceptable. If you don't have those lines drawn before you get, get in there, the devil will help you draw those lines. We could watch anything on there we would want to, but God's people draw a line on what you watch if you watch anything. 
it breaks my heart that I thought, I thought, I used to think ESPN, ESPN was a safe channel to watch until now they got to the point to where they're glamorizing poker. They, they, use, they use sports terms like World Series and, and Poker Tour. And I thought, what in the world does poker have to do with sports? If, uh, 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 something that they used to do in the back holes of alley shanties. And they had to pack a gun to, to, uh, to protect themselves. And I thought, now they glamorize it and they throw millions of dollars on the table. And we've got young people and we've got adults that are looking at think I could win that. I could win that. And we've got college students that are spending, wasting their, their tuition money trying to win the poker. I was in a revival meeting in West Virginia, not the one you're thinking of, but the other one. But I was in a revival meeting in West Virginia. I'd been there about three or four times. This time that I was back, I noticed something different in the town. There was all these new stores that they hadn't had before. Cafes, they called them. But on the signs, it said, cafe and more, cafe and more. Well, I know, I know that Long John Silver's advertises fish and more, and that's why I thought, well, what's a cafe and more? Well, I talked to the pastor when I got into the town, and they said the cafe and more, the more is the video gaming machines. They'd, they'd voted to allow the gaming and the, and the poker and that. And the, what they were telling me was that it had gotten so bad that there are senior citizens there are people on fixed incomes. There are people that come at payday at the end of the week. They sit down there at the video poker machines and, and gaming machines, and they sit there until all their money's gone, and some of them even sit there long enough that they soil themselves because they're afraid to get up and lose their spots. God help us. God help us. We could, we could go and say, I appreciate the Internet. I do a lot of, of engaging my meetings and, and, and conversations with, by, over the Internet. And, and, and it's a wonderful thing for us. It's a wonderful tool. We have about 760 or 70 people in our address book that we can send them out updates just like that. And it's been a wonderful thing for us. We couldn't afford to mail all those letters, but we can send it out over the Internet. But we could sit down at the Internet, and it would not be against the law. It would be socially acceptable. We could surf all kinds of stuff on there, right, young people? There's all kinds of stuff at your fingertips. If you're not careful, you'd better draw some lines before you sit down there. Amen. I will draw a line on anything that's exposed by God's word. I'll draw a line on anything that is not expedient. I'll draw a line on anything that enslaves me. If it starts to get a hold of me, that's where I need to draw a line on it. I've got to be careful. And, and there's, I thought about in my family, for those that want to think about social drinking, I had a cousin that's an alcoholic. I had an aunt on my dad's side that was an alcoholic. I had an uncle on my mom's side that was an alcoholic. My grandfather on my mom's side struggled with alcoholism. And I thought, God, if I, I mean, what if I sat down to be sociable with somebody and thought to be sociable, I had to take a drink. And I thought, I never know. It kind of runs in our family to have a weakness in that area. Matter of fact, I do drink a lot, not booze. But I, I like iced tea and that sort of thing. My wife looks at me and says, man, you drink a lot. It's a good thing you don't drink alcohol. And, and, and that's kind of funny, but I got to thinking, you know what? When I consider the rest of my family, it's a good thing. Careful. Because we kind of have this attitude. The Apostle Paul was dealing with some of this stuff. How many times have you heard something like this? I thought about that congressman by the name of Kenny in Rhode, uh, Kennedy in Rhode Island that caught for, got caught for popping the pills and drinking, and you know, the big stink that was raised because of that. And he said, well, I've been dealing with this sickness all my life. So we got some that are struggling with those things. says, well, it, it, it's a sickness. Did I say, yes, it is a sickness. It's sin sickness. Then we've got some that get wrapped up in some of that stuff and say, well, I can't help it. I'm a product of my environment. And to them I say, you're right. When you live in sin, you become a product of your environment. And there are others that say, well, Brother George, I'm struggling with this aberrant behavior because I think I was born that way. And for those that want to say that, I'd say, you're right. Because we're born with the sin nature and the natural thing to do is sin. 
It may manifest itself maybe in drugs or alcoholism or homosexuality or whatever, but call it what you want to, it's still sin. And the apostle Paul said, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Let me share one more thing with you. Turn with me, chapter 10, verse 23. Chapter 10, verse 23. I'm still in 1 Corinthians. I hope that was my water. If not, I just got somebody else. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. He said to them, all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Guideline number four. I'll draw a line on anything that's exposed by God's word. I'll draw a line on anything that is not expedient. I'll draw a line on anything that enslaves, but I'll draw a line on anything that does not edify. That word edify is the same word that's the root of the word that we have called edifice. When you say, look at that magnificent edifice, you're making reference to a spectacular building. The word edify means to build up. And so we need to draw a line on anything that does not build up. Listen to me. We need to encourage one another. We're in this thing together. The church up the road is not our enemy. The church down the road is not our enemy. The person sitting in the pew next to you is not your enemy. This is a spiritual warfare. And the sooner that we start battling the real enemy and join together, the better off we'll be. Amen. And if we'd start building one another up instead of tearing one another down, I mean, we whine around and say, oh, we could do better if the Lord would just send us some more people. And then the Lord sends in the Calvary and we pick them off as they come in. God help us. The apostle Paul told the Galatian believers in Galatians chapter six, verses one and two, he said this, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual. Now that would eliminate a lot of us from being able to do anything. Ye which are spiritual now have permission to beat them in the head and stomp them in the ground. That's not what it says. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. We can go back to Romans chapter one and we can really point an accusing finger at the lesbians and homosexuals if we want to. Listen to me. In verses 26 and 27 of Romans chapter one, it's very plain about that. We find here in, in, in 1 Corinthians six, the effeminates making reference to that. But listen to me, in that same category, he talks about whisperers and backbiters We'll point a finger at the alcoholic and the prostitute and the drug addict and the homosexual, but we can sit in our church and be judgmental and critical and a backbiter and a gossiper and tear one another down. I got news for you, you're headed for the same destination. We'll draw a line. If it doesn't, I've had people say, well, bless the Lord, it's the truth. And if the truth hurts, so be it. And just because it's the truth, as some folks think, they got permission to tell everything they know that's the truth. You say, Brother George, shouldn't we tell the truth? Watch my head. You ought to be a truthful person. And when it comes to truth versus falsehood, you ought to be truthful. If you're on a witness stand, you ought to always tell the truth. But you realize there's sometimes you just need to keep the truth to yourself. Why? Because to tell the truth doesn't edify. If telling the truth would build up and edify, it'd be all right. But there's some just delight in telling the truth because they know it would jab jab another dagger or just get another edge on somebody, stomp them in just a little or verify maybe what somebody else knows. What are you talking about, Brother George? I'm glad you asked that. Since you did, let's discuss it. I'm looking over the crowd just a minute. Making sure I don't have any close relatives here. The reason I'm doing that is I have some relatives 
if they were here tonight, thank God maybe they're not, they could tell you some truthful things about me. Don't look at me saintly like that. If your relatives were here, they could tell some juicy ones on you too. How about if we just flash it on PowerPoint? What are you talking about? No, there's some, there's some truthful things that could be told about my life that I really would just soon you all didn't know. But I do want you to know this. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Do you realize we got folks in our churches that they know our past and even though it's under the blood, they think God called them not to be fishers of men but fishers of sin and they keep dredging that stuff up and flashing it in front of the world and they keep holding that over our head and will not let us forget it or the world. That doesn't edify. If it's under the blood, thank God it's under the blood and leave it there. Amen. Amen. And just because it's the truth, just learn to keep your mouth shut. If it's not going to encourage, if it's not going to build up, if it's not going to bear one another's burdens, then just keep the trap shut. Draw, learn where to draw the line. If it doesn't edify, draw the line there. Hey, man, that'd stop a lot of conversation, wouldn't it? Amen, Brother George. Now listen to me. Don't you dare leave here tonight and say, I told you how you got to live. And what you got to wear and how you got all that. I didn't. I am suggesting this. You get before God and the Holy Spirit of God. And I think these guidelines that the Apostle Paul used, I think the Holy Spirit will be faithful to show you where you need to draw your lines. I started going, I got into the Holiness Church at about 12 years of age. We were in a very conservative holiness church. And I know some of you won't believe it, but I remember when I was a teenager, not because I have a good memory, it just wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I remember when I was a teenager, my senior picture, my senior picture, I had a head full of hair. I had as much hair as this young man right, right here. I, I did. I know you're wondering. I, just take my word for it. The, just pick any of them. It's got a whole bunch of hair. I had, I had hair like that. But listen to me. I was going to a conservative holiness church then. And I, and I didn't know that much about holiness, holiness, holiness living and that. But you know what I discovered? Those people started loving me. They started praying for me. And they lived the life before me. And as I was walking in the light of God's word and was faithful to get in God's word, you know what the Holy Spirit did? He began to deal with my heart about some things. And the folks didn't drive me and run me out of the church. They encouraged me and lifted me up and prayed for me and modeled it before me. And I wonder if I'd even be in the church today had they tried to shove me in their cookie cutter mold. We need to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. I, I still think he's faithful. I still think he's God enough to be able to speak to us. Now listen, we gotta be careful because we gotta be faithful getting the word and pray and be sensitive and be willing to walk in the light he shows us. But the Holy Spirit's faithful. And church, we need to edify one another. Those of you that are spiritual or think you're spiritual, Let's lift one another up and encourage them and help them. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? The bottom line was this. In chapter 10, verse 31, he said, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do to the glory of God. Do to the glory of God. Where are your lines drawn? Might be somebody don't even, here tonight doesn't even have your lines drawn. Don't let the world draw your lines. Don't let your peers draw your lines. Don't let society draw your lines. I'm not sure they have any lines. We're going to have to draw them. Because if we don't, the world will try to do it for us. Where's your lines drawn? Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts tonight. Show us 
Help us to use these guidelines that the Apostle Paul used and may we use them in our own lives and you show us where you want us to draw our lines. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Number 175. 175. God has sent the Holy Spirit Lord, show me to where to draw my lines. I'll draw a line on anything exposed by God's Word. If God's Word says it's wrong, regardless of what's socially acceptable, it'll be wrong for me. I'll draw a line on anything that's not expedient. If it's not beneficial, if it's not to my advantage emotionally and physically, spiritually, if it's not conducive to godly living, I'll draw a line. I'll draw a line on anything that enslaves me. I don't want the stuff of this world to get a hold on me, whether it's internet pornography, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, drugs, whether it's gambling. I don't want things to get enslaved me. I want to be free. The Lord created me to have dominion over that. We got some that say, well, it's my body and I'll do what I want. No, it's not your body. The the end of chapter 6, he said this, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. It's not your body to do with as you please. It's the Lord's. I'll draw a line on anything that slaves. I'll draw a line on anything that does not edify. Let the Spirit do the planning. Point the way thy feet shall go. We got all of our lines drawn. And thine own his wisdom. He the will of God doth know. Better wiser than thy choosing. If you don't draw them ahead of time, when you get in a compromising situation, it'll be pretty late to draw them then. You already cross them before you think about drawing them. Amen. Brother George. Yield unto the Holy Spirit. Let him have Thou ready to obey He leads to me He does sometimes work in silence When thou dost not know Does sometimes speak so softly? Thou must listen for his call. But if thou wilt trust him fully, he will be thine all in all. He wants his way.
God for the message tonight. Word of God and the Spirit of God. God's two witnesses. And those are the two things that God uses to guide and direct us, our lives as Christians. You know, we take great pleasure in saying we're spirit-filled and spirit-led people. Are we? How about tonight? The Spirit of God, I believe, is dealing with some hearts, willing to yield to the Spirit. Or are you going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God? You're going to cause the Spirit to mourn, to be clothed in sackcloth. You're going to quench it. You're going to smother it. I believe God has sent a message for us all. Brother made a statement about gray areas, you know. I just like to give God the benefit of the doubt in those gray areas. But what about this or what about that? Could it be that you've drawn, drawn some lines, but yet you've removed them, you've crossed over them? You yourself intentionally done that. You willfully crossed over that line that you had marked for your own Christian walk in life. How about coming tonight and reestablishing that line? You know, there needs to be lines of demarcation, lines of separation. And Brother Sherm leads us in another verse. If you have a need, this is a good place to come tonight. God has highly favored us with his presence. God has sent his word. And now his spirit is working. And his spirit never leads contrary to what the word has to say. Amen. They're always in agreement. Won't you come? How about you young people? God bless you. It's, looked, it's so good to see the number of young people in the Lord's house tonight. What a privilege to live for the Lord. You might need to come tonight and just begin to draw some line. Lord, I don't know about this for sure. I don't know whether I are to go here. I don't know whether I are to do that. I don't know whether I are to participate in this. Come and allow God to show you tonight. Sing it, Brother Sherm. All thyself to him surrender. Yes. As he pleases, let in the paths he leadeth follow, whether they be all or new, when the task seems hard before thee, he with power will endure. He wants his will. Let him have his way tonight. Will you mind the spirit tonight? We're highly honored when God's spirit deals with our hearts. Are you willing to let him have his way? Be thou ready to obey. Amen. heart and mind clear everything all right between you and the Lord God bless you we'll leave the word with you appreciate the message tonight